This is How Moral Neuro Enhancement Impacts Autonomy and Agency by Sophie Muller in Bioethics. Here we go. And as always, ask questions along the way. Uh, links in chat at the moment. It'll be below in the, you know, notes if you're watching this later. And you can always type exclamation point uh, paper in chat and it'll pop, the link will pop back up. So. This is, uh, this is always fun, but like, cause talking about like, you know, neuro enhancement, you get the good old cyberpunk uh, future. It's um, fun. Let me drop the music a little. <coughs> and here we go. Would taking a morality pill be ethically viable or would it be a mandatory choice? Philosophers are divided as to the moral implications of such fictive, of, of such a fictive morality pill. Although the possibilities for enhancing agents' ability to make better moral choices through medication are still very limited, philosophical discussions of these possibilities have increased dramatically in recent years. A morality pill is just one example, but technological and pharmaceutical advances might bring an array of different ways of enhancing people morally through neurological intervention. The debate on implications of moral neural, moral neural enhancement, that's MN, I guess they're going to use that, sheds new light on central questions of the philosophy of action and moral responsibility. The possibility of enhancing an agent's ability to make moral choices provides us with a series of difficult moral questions. Is an agent morally responsible for an action performed under the effect of a moral, moral, moral neural enhancement? That's why they don't write it. It's hard to say and think. Can actions performed under the effect of M MN be morally praiseworthy? Are we to regard actions performed by a neuro-enhanced agent as pro products of his or her agency? These questions are not just hypothetical questions that moral philosophers ponder in their armchairs. All these questions have practical corollaries that require an immediate answer. Do they? Because, I mean, the idea that we can actually make a pill to make people more moral seems rather fanciful at this point because I don't know what kind of uh, morality we're uh, talking about. And so if we don't actually know what morality is, how are we getting a pill to do that? Now, maybe we can just make an arbitrary morality and, you know, say like, hey, the person's acting according to our arbitrary morality and therefore there should be, you know, that's a good thing. But um, again, Valpo, a lot of food could use some moral. <laughs> yes, it could. Morals are f tasty. Um, I hope how you're doing. I hope you're well. Hope you're, uh, if you have started your semester, I hope that has started well too. Um, but I mean, how are we to make a pill to do anything to get people to act in a certain way? We've never been able to do that before. I don't see why we're going to do it now. Now, the question is, could we have like some sort of like monitoring device that could like, you know, force people to act uh, in a certain way? I don't know. But, um,. That wouldn't be a pill, but, like, could you just put, like, a little monitor on someone's shoulder and that would, like, buzz every time they were, like, if, like, someone was watching them, like, not now, naughty, naughty, don't do that. So that'd be, like, the definition of a nanny state. But, like, you know, we could do that now. We could have a nanny state right now, have someone always watching you and being, like, don't do that, that's bad. Yeah. Mm, I haven't had more L's in a while. Now you're making me hungry again. But I have beer today. Beer. So. There goes my brain. When discussing the ethical problems associated with MN, that's moral neuroenhancement, many scholars focus on its effects on agency, on agents' individual autonomy understood as the ability to choose which preferences, desires, values, etc. to act on. Defenders of MN argue that it should be permitted when undergone voluntarily because this type of intervention enhances agents' autonomy by allowing them to suppress immoral urges. These defenses rely on a definition of autonomy that features elements of authenticity. Individual autonomy is to act in accordance with one's true self, but also the ability to govern oneself or a condition for moral accountability. So here's a question. I mean, again... Who knows what the hell it is to be your authentic self? Like, what is this authentic, uh, true self? What What is that? Like, I don't know what your true self is. People like to say, oh, that's not really who I am when they fuck up. That's not really me. I didn't really mean that. I was like, weakness of will, acrasia, that's not really what I am. I mean, I tend to find that those sorts of things, uh, 
I mean, I, I understand the person might really be um, apologetic and feel bad and remorseful. I just don't find that those sorts of uh, those statements to be uh, uh, that theory of like authenticity is like, well, that's one way of looking at stuff. But I don't know if there's any true self like that exists anywhere except in some fantasy uh, in someone's mind. And so it's like the idea that you're going to uh, appeal to some fantasy in their mind about how they ought to be is uh hey evolve yourself how you doing so if like someone is appealing to like a fantasy of themselves I'm like well that's not my true self my true self is much better it's like no nah, you were a shithead i think that's what you are and like, I, I i got this idea that you are like have some a uh, grand idea that you're a better person but that's not what you did and so appealing to like oh well that wasn't really me it's like well then who the fuck are you right now but who the fuck is Evolve Yourself? Evolve Yourself is a buddy. Evolve Yourself, everyone go follow Evolve Yourself if you do not know. Evolve Yourself, check them out at twitch.tv slash evolveyourselftv. Uh, Evolve Yourself is a metaphysician, philosopher of science. Uh, I always forget the third thing. Mind, philosopher of mind. Also a chess instructor. A chess instructor in Chicago. So you can like learn. You go to a stream. You learn. You get a little bit of philosophy. You get a little bit of chess uh, content. And you also get, which is a lot of the content is, uh, you know, some meditation, chakra balancing. So you're getting like Evolve Yourself is like a full body, full mind, like holistic sort of getting hitting all the uh, things. So who the fuck is that? That's who you should be following. That's who you, or at least if, if not subscribing to, if you have the uh, financial ability to do so. So that's who Evolve Yourself is. <laughs> Anywho, yeah, so welcome in Evolve Yourself. We're reading this uh, paper on the implications of moral neuroenhancement. So, and I mean, I, I'm just griping about uh, what it means to be authentic. I mean, it's like, okay, you want to go talk to the 20th century uh, existential philosophers about uh, authenticity? That's great. Tell me um, what you mean by authenticity without, like, hand-waving. Then you're going to get somewhere. But, like, you know, it's uh, like, oh, that's not really what uh, it is to be me. It's not my authentic self. It's like, go fuck, yeah, go whack off. Like, that's your authentic self. I don't want to hear this shit. Yeah, it's like, explain it to me. Explain it to me, all right? Okay. Despite their initial plausibility, they do have a great veneer of, like, success these uh things but I, i'm i'm already liking this uh, author here despite their initial plausibility all these accounts focus on individual autonomy even though it captures but one aspect of practical agency consider the following statement of of an act judith killed holofernes this wording is helpful when determining whether judith should be held accountable for holofernes death we Yet we should remember that it is a simple description of the act. To capture other aspects of the act, we might add physical details. Judith killed Holofernes with his own sword, or psychological details. Judith killed Holofernes in cold blood, or intellectual details. Judith killed Holofernes because she believed he would destroy her city. These added details show that there are many different aspects of practical agency. Yeah, well, Evolve Yourself has been streaming a bit, so he's around. To properly, uh, uh, properly assess m moral neuroenhancement, we need to consider its effects not just on autonomy, but on all aspects of human agency. Once we have this overview, can we consider the possibility of repercussions of moral, ne moral neuroenhancement? Oh, excuse me. I'm drinking beer. The neuroenhancement literature overlooks that autonomy is but one component of agency taken as the ability to cause change in the world. Once we consider more detailed more detailed dimensions of agency, it becomes much harder to defend moral neuroenhancement as an intervention that promotes agency. In this paper, I, I confront the challenges of MN with one of the most sophisticated accounts of agency available today, the one presented by John Hyman in his 2015 book, Action, Knowledge, and Will. I consider the impact impact of MN on what Hyman terms the four dimensions of agency, psychological, ethical, intellectual, and physical. I then use this analysis to discuss possible defenses of MN. Finally, I reconsider MN in light of the functional integration of reason and emotions in practical agency. To illustrate the impact of moral neuroenhancement on different aspects of agency, I use examples from criminal law. The aim of these examples is not to argue for substantive legal claims, but rather to show why having a better understanding of the relationship between autonomy and moral neuroenhancement is crucial.
All right, so they've set themselves up for an awful lot in the next eight pages. I mean, it's kind of like 16 pages because it's uh, double columned, but still. So, you know what I'm going to do? I'm also going to, uh, and like, as always, feel free to ask questions. I'm going to, you know, I, I wonder if this helps, like, for discoverability. Moral. Neuro. And. Hands. <laughs> Mint. There we go. Because I wonder if people can see this when they're browsing streams, but I don't know. But I think they might. Okay. So this is what we're talking about here. Is this what effect does moral neuro enhancement have on agency? And this person is going to kind of come at it from a few different sides and be like, we're, we've been too focused on one of them. But like they've got a lot of ground to cover according to what they just said. Okay, when considering Judith killing Holofernes, we saw that, and if anyone doesn't know Judith killing Holofernes, uh, let me actually pull that up. Yeah, so this is a famous uh, artwork, and it's been done many, many times. So we've got Judith here killing Holofernes, and she cut his head off. Vipers, people have accused you of neuroenhancement, but to my critics, I say 011000101010110. I'm just gonna stop. I'm not a fucking TTS. <laughs> How are you, Vipers? I hope you're well. So, yeah, this is a very famous um, theme in art. So, yeah, you can see Judith killing Holofernes with his own knife. So, this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about a lady beheading a dude. And it's usually gruesome and graphic and an awful lot of, like, she looks kind of badass. Like, people love this because it's a nicely themed woman just, like, you know, cutting this dude's head off. And so, uh, I forget the background on this. Um, yeah, so he was about to destroy the home city. Um, so he's drunk and she decapitates him. So, yeah. So this is what we're talking about when we say Judith, uh, decapitates, uh, kills Holofernes. So, just so, so everyone's, uh, on the same page of what's going on. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Autonomy is often decisive in deciding the immoral implications of an act and assigning responsibility. Yeah. Rapist. Um, I thought it was saying on this that he was um, not always rapist. It seems like um, he was going to destroy the city. But I also heard rapist. Um, yeah, it doesn't say that right here. But uh, that's. I think um, Valpo is right that it's often interpreted that she's behead beheading her rapist. So. Um, but yeah, it didn't say that right there, which is interesting. I thought it was that. Anywho. So, Judith... Okay, a more complete... So, blah, 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 blah. Autonomy is often decisive in deciding the moral implications of an act and in assigning responsibility. Yet, despite its moral importance, it does not capture all aspects of agency. A more complete picture would include physical, psychological, and intellectual details. Judith, Judith did not just kill Holofernes, she did so with a specific weapon in a specific psychological state and for specific reasons. The different paintings of the scene show that these other aspects change how we see the act. Caravaggio's Judith is performing a very different act from the one rep represented by Rubens. One is concentrated and disgusted, the other is relaxed and tri triumphant. And so this is what I mean, uh, like we're going back to here, so you can see this is... Um, yeah, see, this one, like, this is very different here from, you know, this one here. So, like, they're all, like, sort of getting at different aspects of the whole, of the same act, or similar acts, whatever it is. This example shows that there are other aspects of agency in addition to autonomy that, and that they matter for how we understand an act. When focusing on autonomy, we, we risk eschewing the other dimensions of agency. Hyman argues that there are four irreducible but integrated dimensions of agency, a physical dimension in which the principal concepts are agent, power, and causation, an ethical dimension in which they are voluntariness and choice, a psychological dimension with the concepts of desire, aim, and intention, and intellectual dimension with the concept of reason, knowledge, and belief. 
For Hyman, the whole point of the philosophy of action is to understand these dimensions of human action, to distinguish between them and to explain how they are related to each other, not to amalgamate them or to equate them or reduce them in number. I mean, okay, if that's how you want to talk about stuff, you just want to say these are the things and we're going to break it down that way, that's fine. But I mean, it's like that's a metaphysical picture. And, you know, it's going to cover most of the bases. That's how these things go. If you want to break stuff down to, you know, like whatever that is, like 12 uh, or something different uh, properties that you want to do, you're going to cover almost everything that you want to talk about if between, you know, those 12 and maybe combinations of them. So... Hyman notes that the modern theory of the will conflates voluntariness and agency because it focuses on volition as a mental act. The modern theory represented the modern theory represented voluntary action, intention action, intentional action, and action as such, that is action that can be imputed to an individual as the agent by means of a single picture. Desire, or the uneasiness of desire, causes the mental act of volition, which in turn causes motion in our limbs. Hyman's point is that the relationship between mental acts and physical action cannot be defined in positive causal terms, which is why we should abandon the idea of volition as a mental event that causes motion. Instead of volition as a mental act, we should focus on voluntariness as a mark of agency. Hyman argues that the causal relationship between voluntariness and action can only be defined in negative terms. Voluntary action is action not due to ignorance or compulsion. Uh, I mean, sure. This is like what I mean by you're going to cover most of when you start breaking things down into this many things, you're going to be able to like, you know, split stuff up and that's fine. Like other people are trying to be more, you know, you try not to multiply what you're talking about. But if you want to get more specific, a lot of times you do have to multiply stuff and then you have to like to get more specific. You have to talk about you have to add more terms in to get more and more specific. Now is there a point here it's like yes like there's something metaphysically different between these acts and like the mental and the physical and the causal and so you can't always get away with fewer words even though sometimes that gives you more explanatory power um but yeah so here's the question like as far for the metaphysicians among us like if you're talking about explanation here if they are like multiplying terms at this point are we really explaining things or are we just redefining our problem into into these other terms but like, yeah. Okay. For Hyman, voluntariness is part of the ethical dimension. Voluntariness is, in other words, uh, not a specific mental state that agents associate with their action. It is a negatively defined concept, and action is voluntary if it does not have certain types of causes. He uses an example from Locke to explain this notion. A man might be locked in a room with a group of friends. If the man then spends hours inside the room talking to his friends, he never realizes that he could not have acted differently. He had no choice but to stay inside the room, but his action was nevertheless voluntary. This shows that the voluntariness is defined by negation. It is the case in which there, there are no exculpations. Exculpa I haven't said that in a while. Exculpations. No factors that exclude guilt. It is an ethical concept because it is its principal function is to assess innocence or guilt. Since a choice can be made under threat, mere choice is not a sufficient criterion for voluntariness. Because humans are not just Cartesian thinking substances, but complex beings, we need to think of our agency as consisting of different parts. While we should keep the four dimensions of agency apart when analyzing agency, Hyman emphasizes that the dimensions are functionally integrated. The easiest way to think of functional integration is through an image of, comp of a complex institution such as a university. Okay, and this is what I mean. This is what everyone has to do. If you break things down into like a bunch of different parts, you then you have to recombine them into the whole to explain any causal action because otherwise you're going to be talking about pe parts that don't work together and you can't have parts that don't work together and then have one like overall arching explanation of what happened so you need to be able to recombine things uh, later so this is just like the strategies of uh how you break down the world and what kind of work you're trying to do again there are pluses and minuses to both of these things if you start with a lot of pieces then you have to combine them if you start with very few pieces then you have to be able to multiply the complexity at some point to get to all the different features in the world again what's the point being argued here is the question and why is the uh, author using this strategy but anyway the, the easiest way to think of a functional integration is through an image of a complex institution such as a university 
Only a university as a whole can award degrees, but its administrative offices, exam boards, individual professors and lecturers, etc. all have to follow the procedures laid down in the university's statutes and regulations for it to do so. The university as a whole has the power to award degrees and is not purely aggregative power, but its exercise depends on the integrated exercise of the powers of its functionally different parts differentiated parts. So the agency of the whole supervenes on the agency of its parts in the sense that if the acts of the university depend, university departments, offices, and staff are fixed, the acts of the university as a whole are fixed as well. The whole cannot act independently of its parts. All right, let me just point out one word. Anytime you see the word supervenes, you should be on alert. It's very rarely uh, not abused. Is one of the, what I think is one of the more abused uh, words in philosophy. Supervenes basically means that the whole has to, you know, function as the parts do, but they're not explaining how that happens. It just means it does happen that way. And so, you, anytime you see that, this is what I mean. This is part of the. Uh, like if you start with a lot of parts, then you have to somehow combine them and they don't explain this. And it's like right there. It's like I told you when I was reading it up here that they had to do a combination and then it happened right there because this is just the structure of these arguments. Hyman invites us to think of agency in this way. The physical, psychological, ethical, and intellectual dimensions are functionally different parts that together form the non-aggregated power of human agency. The non-aggregative agency of complex substances with functionally differ differentiated parts depends on the integrated operation of these parts rather than on the operation of a specific part. For example, take Locke's question. My right hand moves, my right hand writes, whilst my left hand is still. What causes, my, what causes rest in the one and the motion in the other? The modern theory of the will would say that the right hand is performing a voluntary action because its movement is caused by desire or volition to write. The left hand is still because no volition is causing it to move. Hyman would say that the physical movement is not caused by a previous intention. It is an integrated part of the action. The desire to move the hand is the psychological dimension of the action. The psychological dimension cons consists in the desire and the choices that work as causal factors in the movement. The ethical dimensions, the dimension concerns the responsibility for the action if compulsion and ignorance are excluded as causes. Finally, in the intellectual dimension, knowledge is an ability that is carried out in the action. Okay, yeah. So yeah, we've got all these things and then you break it down, but then the whole body somehow uh, aggregates these things and is able to do this stuff. But again, how exactly they'll come together, not explained, but they don't really care. That's not the important thing here. They're not doing metaphysics or mind. Okay, three, autonomy and agency in the neuroenhancement literature. Okay, so this is what we're going to do here. We're outlining a theory of how we are, our agency is, and then we're going to compare it to the neuroenhancement literature, and I guess the author is going to say they don't match up. And that's like the whole argument here, it looks like. There's a clear intuition in the literature that moral neuroenhancement in some way or other interferes with the autonomy of moral agents, whether by promoting or diminishing it. The fear is that if moral neuroenhancement changes the behavior and cognitive patterns of moral agents, then the actions of these agents the actions that these agents produce are no longer autonomous. Yeah, so if I drink beer here, it changes something in my mind, as does all things I consume. And beer, uh, alcohol, or any drug for that matter, does it more um, readily. It changes things quicker and it, it has known psychological uh, effects. So, has that changed my morals? But I mean, you don't know if, um, I mean, we take it that it does because we forgive people for being drunk for certain things. Or we might not, but like, that is a thing. So we could treat beer as a moral neuroenhancement. It's not enhancing, it's a de-enhancement, but like, or maybe not. But you can think of it like, that's really all it is. It's diminishing our agency, perhaps? Like, so right there, I have one in my hand. But like, we don't have it, but it'd be a de-enhancement versus an enhancement. The fear is that if moral neural enhancement changes the behavior and cognitive patterns of moral agents, as does beer, then the actions of these agents produced are no longer autonomous. Yeah, and so we f do forgive people for being idiots when they're drunk. I mean, as long as, like, within reason, 
you know, we forgive certain idiocy when you're drunk. Like, it's like, I know someone's drunk. It's okay they're being an idiot. Like, if they went and puked, I'm like, oh, man, they went and puked. Now, if they were sober and they puked all over themselves, I, that'd be, a, in some sense, a worse problem. If they're drunk and they puked all over themselves, well, you drank too much, but, like, I understand. Like, that happens. But, like, that's a different issue. But if you were sober and you puke all over yourself and you're like, why do you do that? Couldn't you, like, go to the bathroom? It's like, that's a different sort of problem. Okay, in some accounts, the definition of autonomy also features authenticity, while others reject this. Defenders of moral neuro neuroenhancement argue that it promotes agency either by strengthening the agent's authentic self or as an extinction of an agent's autonomy. The theory behind these discussions of autonomy is Harry Frankfurt's account of first and second order desires. First order desires are statements of the form A wants X, but wanting is not willing and the will is an effective desire one that moves or one or will or would move a person all the way to action. A second order desire is when an agent wants simply to have a certain desire or when he wants a certain desire to be as well. Yeah. So it's like, if you want to be like, go do something, but you like, you want to like study, but you aren't actually studying, but you want to actually like have the will to study or get some work done. But so that's the second order. Like if you actually wanted to go study and you just got it done, that's the first order. But if like you were like, oh man, I need to study for that test, but you don't really want to, that's your second order. Cause you want, you even want simply to have the certain desire. You want to have the will to study. Okay. We will see below that proponents of moral neuroenhancement argue that MN interventions promote freedom of the will in Frankfurt's sense by enhancing the power of second-order desires over first-order desires. Proponents see MN as a way of allowing second-order desires to promote certain first-order desires and to make them effective in action. Gerald Dworkin calls this congruence between first and second order desires authenticity, which he first defined but then abandoned as a necessary but not sufficient condition of autonomy. He later amended his definition of autonomy to the capacity to raise the question of whether I will identify with or reject the reasons for which I now act. This amended definition makes autonomy a third order reflection on second order desires. Frankfurt's account of first and second order desires and Dworkin's understanding of authenticity and autonomy are repeated in many arguments both for and against moral neuro neuroenhancement. Yeah, so it's like... Do you think, like, because you're basically appealing to reason for your second order of stuff. Like, I need to get this work done. I want to be able to get my work done, but, like, I don't feel like it okay right now. So then, like, you're using your reason as a stand-in for, like, the actual desire. Um, so then could you just, like, flip a switch and say, all right, I'm going to go work now. A, problem, a prominent example of an approach that uses first and second order desires to analyze the implications of moral neuroenhancement is the one proposed by Thomas Douglas. Considering the implications of MN, Douglas argues that enhancing one's future motives would be morally permissible. He pro provides an explicit account of the way in which this type of enhancement would promote rather than obstruct agency. Douglas argues that there are some emotions that are a reduction in the degree to which an agent experiences those emotions would, under some circumstances, constitute a moral enhancement and provides counter-moral emotions such as an aversion towards certain racial groups and the impulse towards violent aggression as examples. In other words, Douglas is arguing that MN allows certain second-order desires to prevail over or even eradicate counter-moral emotions that serve as first-order desires. Douglas considers 10 possible objections to the example of Smith, who undergoes voluntary enhancement of his moral motives. The objection on grounds of restricted freedom contained the most explicit account of how MN impacts agency and voluntariness. This view could be sustained by regarding the self as being divided into two parts, the true or authentic self and a brute self that is external to this true self. One could then regard any aspect of the brute self which constrains the true self as a constraint on freedom. Okay. I'm sure the author is going to say something about this. I, I could say something about this too, but let's see what the author says first. Douglas argues that the enhancement allows Smith to control the impulses of his brute self and thus enhance his true self through voluntary mor moral neuroenhancement. By help helping Smith control his root tendencies, or brute, or maybe that, yeah, me missing a B there, the enhancement increases the freedom of his true self. Since Smith's enhancement is assu assumed to attenuate certain emotions, it presumably works by suppressing those brute emo 
mechanisms that generate the relevant emotions. The enhancement seems to work by reducing the influence of Smith's brute self and thus allowing his true self greater freedom. It would be more accurate to say that the enhancement increases Smith's freedom to to have and to act upon good motives than to say that it diminishes his freedom to have and to act upon bad ones. You know, this is interesting. Like, I don't really buy, like, this sort of brute self and then true self, like, distinction. Who knows what counts as brute and not. Sounds like you're getting a very sort of uh, watered-down view of, like, human life if, like, we aren't our normal brute selves. But, I mean, I could see somebody who had, like, you know, you know, they had a uh, addiction to some drug and they don't want to be addicted to the drug, but like the pull of like the drug just is very, very, very strong. And so they want to be able to suppress those emotions that make them go to that drug. And it's like, well, okay, then that would permit them to have a life without the drug, which is in some sense more freedom as opposed to the one freedom that they're giving up of the quote unquote brute uh, desire for the uh, addictive substance. The distinction between a true self and a brute self allows Douglas to claim that a man is a promotion of agency rather than a limitation. By undergoing the treatment, the true self takes control over the brute self and reestablishes him or herself as the, well, their self, as the active agent. A man allows Smith to enhance the influence of their second order desires over their brute first order desires. However, Douglas, Douglas's distinction between a brute and and true self raises more questions than it answers. One might object that the brute self is just as authentic as what Douglas calls the true self. As Boakchamp and Childress have pointed out, second order desires might be caused by particularly strong first order desires and consequently might not be more authentic than first order desires. Hyman's account of functional integration shows that we cannot simply isolate desires from their integration with the other dimensions of agency. Desires are integrated with physical movement, choice, and beliefs that should not be seen as isolated causes of actions and events. This is interesting. Well, this is not interesting, actually. But it's a—it's uh, like I agree with the statement. I, I just was going to point out this, the break right here between how they argued they say like these are criticisms of the douglas account and then the author just switches into their preferred account right here without a segue i was like all right i'm wondering if like they could have actually fixed this up they could have said this better but um because they're just appealing to the functional integration account they're not appealing to an actual argument here they're just saying but look this account says something else whereas uh the smith account uh doesn't say this and so this argument here is a little funky I mean, I don't disagree with what they're doing, but it's just an interesting thing. You can see that they were saying, okay, the two like second order desires aren't the different than the first order desires. Why? Whatever. And so then, but then they're saying, well, appeal to the Hyman account of what the uh, functional integration should be. Now, is that a good move? I don't know. They didn't argue for that, but they just stated it right here, like uh, this way. Oh, there. But like, that's how it went. <coughs> so, yeah. The way we tend to entangle the different dimensions of agency also becomes clear in other dis discussions of how MN impacts autonomy. A good example is the work of Niklas Juth, who argues that MN promotes autonomy, which he defines as containing different aspects. As generally defined, to be autonomous is to govern oneself, and to live autonomous autonomous autonomously is to live in accordance with one's basic desires or values. One can discern three components from this general characterization. Will or desire or value that is a uh, pro attitude decision and action rather than distinguishing between a brute and authentic self juth understands autonomy as an interplay between will decision and action his claim is that autonomy can be neurologically enhanced by promoting these three components although he specifies three different components of autonomy he still relies on an understanding of one basic one's basic desires of or values as a form of authentic core that is promoted through enhancement. Again, his point is that MN allows for second order desires understood as basic desires to prevail over conflicting first order desires. We here find why Hyman diagnoses as the conflation of voluntariness and agency. We here find what Hyman diagnoses as the conflation of voluntariness and agency. The voluntary choice of a first order desire is identified as agency, whereas first order desires are only seen as part of agency if they are authenticated by a second order desire. 
This is interesting. Authenticated. That means, and so in some sense, your first order desires don't count as real unless they are in accordance. They are being authenticated, uh, vouchsafed by a second order desire. Like so, there's some sort of reason that's going on, which is weird. Why do you have to think about reason all the time? Um, to guarantee all your like emotions and all that stuff that seems a little excessive but I mean I guess maybe as questions of choice then you have to but even then like it, why would you have to have uh, pre-thought everything you know you pre-considered all your actions that's a weird uh, view of the world a, like weird view of people not the world I mean I have not pre-considered all my actions going forward and so how would I have a second order desire except in some very abstract sense it's like, yes, I hope I do good in the future. Yeah, sure. And like, and all the good things I do, co uh, you know, are authenticated by that second order desire. But that's meaningless. Uh, did I miss the definition of the order of desires? I'm guessing this is the same idea system as one and two thinking. Yeah, probably. I'm not sure what one and two thinking is. The two desires are first, the first order desire is like your brute desires, like whatever like your immediate reactions are. Second order desires are like your reasoned desires. Um, so like it's basically a... Uh, like you've got the brute mechanisms they say the brute mechanisms that generate desire or like that's your first order stuff and then the second order is what you're like you want in sort of like abstract sense um so yeah where was that did they have a good definition no i don't know if they even did a good definition of it they, d they say over here, the distinction between a true and a brute self allows Douglas to claim that mor moral neuroenhancement is a promotion of agency rather than a limitation. And so basically you're getting your, you know, whatever you want to do in line with what you think you should be doing. The second order is what you think you should be doing. But of course, there's like, who the fuck knows what you should be doing or why you're thinking you should be doing it at any given point. Okay. If, but ask more questions if I'm not making this clear enough. I mean, there is more here, and we could figure out. We could probably pull this apart a bit better if you want to go into it. Okay. As a result, yes, gotcha. System one thing is all, all the automatic stuff, where system two is conscious and logical. Yeah, that I think that's how the uh, author is breaking this down. I mean, there might be some conscious stuff happening at the the like level one, but it seems like it's non-reflective. So. Okay, as a result, the concept of agency was invested with an ethical character it does not have, and the concept of voluntariness was divested of the ethical character it does have. Okay, so this is what happens when you, um... Yeah, so this is what... If you conflate all this stuff, you, you're mixing up these things where you have ethical character and not. Living autonomously includes a psychological dimension of desires, an ethical dimension of voluntariness, and an intellectual dim dimension of decision, all of which are connected with action. The result is an ethical concept of autonomy that invests the invests ugh, that invests the other dimensions of agency with eth with an ethical character. Invests. That's a weird way of saying it. I'm sorry. Just, I find that sentence weird. In particular, the psychological dimension of having our desires and pro-attitudes and identifying with them is given ethical significance by this entanglement of the different dimensions. Okay, so basically, yeah. So you've got a whole bunch of things mixed together, but like if you don't consider each of them, then you don't really understand what's going on. But because they all work together, then you can like say, well, there is an ethical dimension to all of them. Yeah. I mean, this is what I'm saying. Like, when I was complaining earlier about um, how these things mix, this saying they're entangled does not explain anything. That's just saying that, like, somehow they mysteriously come together to create action. I mean, this is a mysterious uh, thing, entanglement here. But still, it's not like it's that crazy. You've got a few different things going on, and you are the one that's, like, the whole you is what is doing the uh, action in the end, though. Okay, Jan Christoph Bublitz and Reinhard Merkel provide a sophisticated account of how MN influences autonomy. They give the following broad definition of autonomous agents. Autonomous agents 
possesses the capacity for discerning right from wrong, are reason responsive, have a minimal level of self-control, have a minimally proper understanding of the world around them, have not been manipulated, and identify with their traits, including their desires. Therefore, if agents who possess the minimal autonomy capacity capacities identify with their enhanced personality traits and have not been manipulated, there is no reason to deny them autonomy on the grounds that they are inauthentic. Okay, so basically, if you're, you know, right, of right mind, then you are autonomous. Bublitz and Merkel use this definition of autonomy to argue against the focus of, on authenticity in discussions of moral neuro, neuro enhancement. They specify that actions are not in the strict sense caused by neuroenhancement. Instead, they argue that neuroenhancements change a person's pro-attitudes towards certain actions, and they convincingly show that structural theories of autonomy as the harmony between lower and higher level desires are problematic when considering the possibility of moral neuro neuroenhancement. The structural accounts of autonomy, such as those of Harry Frankfurt and Gerald Dworkin, identification through higher order desires make lower order desires autonomous and authentic. However, as Bublitz and Merkel point out, structural accounts are insensitive to social relationships that shape higher order desires. Instead, they argue we should focus on the absence of manipulation as a condition of autonomy. They conclude that if agents who possess the minimal autonomy capacities self-initiate neuroenhancements, then they identify with the results, they are autonomous. If they are manipulated or do not identify with the results, then they are not autonomous. Doing away with authenticity, Bublitz and Merkel define autonomy as identification without manipulation. They admit that the uh, process of identification may be enhanced, but since they exclude authenticity as a criterion of autonomy, they see this as a feature rather than a flaw of moral neuroenhancement. Neuroenhanced agents are autonomous if they identify with their enhanced traits and have not been manipulated into enhancing themselves or identifying with their enhanced traits. Bublitz and Merkel point Merkel's point is that if we accept unintended side effects of moral neuroenhancement as a legal exculpation, then we open the door to accepting non-enhanced personality traits as legal exculpations as well. Yeah, so it's like you already have to completely agree with everything that the moral the moral neuroenhancement is going to do. Because if you already 100% agree with that and all the things it's going to do, then you can say, all right, well, I'm doing this willingly. And like, that's it. Full stop. I accept all the consequences. But if there is anything that's going on that is outside of what you thought it was going to be, then you're saying, well, that wasn't what I chose and it wasn't, uh, I'm not responsible for it. But if you're going to say that, that it's not what I chose, I'm not responsible for it, then a lot of stuff you're going to be able to say, well, I didn't mean to crash that car when I was drunk. I'm not responsible for it. And so it's very, you got to be careful there. And that's what the author is pointing out here, or that uh, Bublitz and Merkel are pointing out here. How does Bublitz and Merkel's account of autonomy fit with Hyman's four dimensions of agency? Their understanding of autonomy as identification with certain pro-attitudes combines the ethical dimensions of voluntariness and choice with the psychological dimensions of desire and intention. Bublitz and Merkel correctly point out that MN does not directly cause actions, but by focusing on the causal modification of desires, they adopt an account of agent agency that conflates its physical, ethical, psychological, and intellectual dimensions. Hyman's point about the psychological dimension is that we should not understand desires as causes, but rather as dispositions that are manifested in goal-directed behavior. We can then turn to the ethical dimension of this goal-directed behavior and ask whether it was voluntary by considering whether it was performed out of ignorance or, or compulsion. In defining voluntariness as the absence of exculpating factors, Hyman would agree with Bublitz and Merkel that an act is self-imposed and not manipulated. That an act is self-imposed and not manipulated is voluntary. The problem is that this only applies to the single act and not to the subsequent change in all the dimensions of agency occasioned by moral neuroenhancement. Even though the act of undergoing MN might qualify as voluntary, this does not necessarily imply that the following acts are voluntary as well. I return to this question below when considering how Prozac defenses are treated by the law. Yeah, you gotta think about this. You don't know all the... <coughs> You don't know all the downstream effects that changing yourself now is going to create. So you might agree with all the outcomes that are you can see now. But how are you going to see all the downstream effects of how these things change you over time? That's going to be very hard. 
These accounts of autonomy inherit a problem from Frankfurt's account of desires. As Joseph Raz has pointed out, Frankfurt made externality dependent on people's own attitude to themselves and made it impossible to distinguish externality from people's disapproval of, how, of the way they are. But then, what authenticates the authenticators? If enhanced by moral neural enhancement, the authenticator appears in want of authentication, but is left with no higher instance of appeal. For this reason, this version of individual autonomy as self-identification is insufficient for assessing an enhancement of the self. Yeah, I mean, if you just throw in with whatever moral neural enhancement is, there is no way for you to, again, reflect on that because that is guaranteeing that, that this is what you're going to think in the future, and you no longer have a, an, I don't know, what kind of independent way of reconsidering yourself. Viper's Gratitude says, did the author define a baseline for non-neuroenhanced? If you're starving and your cognitive ability is impaired, then eating anything would be an act of neuroenhancement. If you eat though through desperate instinct, wouldn't that call the voluntariness into question? No, they did not talk about um, uh, that sort of thing. I did mention me drinking beer right now, and I mentioned the beer as being a neuro uh, neuro D enhancer. So I did bring that up very briefly earlier. I don't know if you were here yet, but um, no, the author has not talked about that. And it is a good point because that would seem like, you know, a very important thing that like has to be accounted for. Like you need to talk about like what is the baseline for what is a voluntary act and non-voluntary act. Like could you, if you're starving, still starve yourself? And people do starve themselves to death. I mean, on purpose, like uh, in a protest. So it's like... um desperate instinct wouldn't be uh, voluntary but like you know some people can overcome that so maybe it is voluntary and uh that's a good point but like yeah they don't talk about they haven't talked about uh overcoming like what that is to overcome <coughs> all right so yeah it, it's too bad there's no baseline while Bublitz and Merkel focus on autonomy as an ideal for an, an agent, Hyman's analysis... Wait, did I miss... Oh, no, no. Here's where we're going. Hyman's analysis of agency fits better with a decisional account of autonomy, such as the one developed by Tom Bochamp and James Childress. For them, the autonomous individual acts freely in accordance with a self-chosen plan an analogous to the way an independent government manages its territories and sets its policies. They argue that second-order desires are an inadequate standard of autonomy for two reasons. First, because second-order desires can be generated prior by prior desires or commitments and thereby, thereby not differ significantly from first-order desires. And second-order and second, because second-order reflection of first-order desires represents an ideal beyond the reach of normal choosers. Instead, they yeah, I think that is actually what... Um, it might be what you're getting at is that sometimes you get a second order desire off your first order one, but then how do you actually uh, adjudicate at that point? Like if you're so hungry, you need to eat, then all your focus is that way too. So it could be like impossible to actually overcome uh, your first order desires by second order. And it's a, uh, might not be a good idea to overcome that at certain times. Okay. Instead, they focus on the decisional autonomy of normal choosers who act one, intentionally, two, with understanding, and three, without controlling influences that determine their action. Yeah, so maybe this is the thing. Like, if you lose your intentionality due to being so hungry, or you're ravenous. The implication is that autonomy should not be considered as an ideal of an agent, but rather as an evaluation of a specific decision. This means that the same agent might make some decisions that are substantially autonomous and others that are not. This account of autonomy meshes much better with Hyman's analysis of the different dimensions of agency. Bochamp's and Childress criteria cover one, the psychological dimension, two, the intellectual di dimension, and three, the ethical dimension of agency. They exclude the physical dimension by focusing on decisional rather than executive autonomy, which allows them to consider actions of those with limited decisional capabilities. Okay, so yeah. But see, this, this is interesting. Well, not, I don't, again, this is structurally interesting because you've got different theories that have, you know, multiple pieces, and those match up much better when you have multiple pieces. Now, 
did the author here argue that this is a better theory? No, they're just arguing that it had more pieces that matched up with their preferred theory. And so does that make it good? Maybe, maybe not, but it does match up better. So, I mean, there's a structural uh, congruity. Con yeah, congruity here but like that doesn't actually uh imply good it just means similarity okay the impact of neuro enhancement on functionally integrated agency <coughs> under hyman's description of voluntariness as the lack of exculpating factors could an agent under the influence of a moral neuro enhancement which she has undergone voluntarily be exculpated from guilt for the actions she performed while influenced by the moral neuro enhancing technology i believe so, author believes so this becomes especially clear when considering legal cases in which the question of exculpating factors is decisive take the so-called prozac defense as used in the case Tobin versus Smith Klein. This is a case not of moral neuro enhancement, but of psychiatric medication. But I believe that it allows us to draw conclusions for this for the legal implication of moral neuro enhancement as well. In this case, Timothy Tobin sued the ph pharmaceutical company Smith Klein for damages because his father in law, Donald Shell, killed himself, his wife, and Tobin's wife and daughter 48 hours after starting tre treatment with the antidepressant packs wow i did not know this so we had a rampage with like a murderous rampage and they were saying that it was a uh, prozac uh or paxil or whatever tobin won the case and was awarded 6.4 million in damages the jury ruled that the actions of shell were caused by the drug and that smith klein were therefore liable for the damages in this case, the side effects of the antidepressant counted as exculpating factors even though Shell had undergone the treatment voluntarily. Would the same reasoning apply to an agent who had undergone moral neural enhancement? Okay, so if the guy knew all the factors, yeah, see, knowing all the factors is one thing. Knowing that you're going to kill some your entire family is not in the, uh, you know, the fine print. So I guess that's what they were saying. It's like, look, there were possibilities that this happened, but no one was expecting this. And so that basically, I guess they're blaming the drug company for having way more or way worse um, uh, side effects than was indicated. <laughs> yeah, and that's the question. You don't know all the side effects for all the people. So it's just you can't. Brian D. Earp, Thomas Douglas, and Julian Savalescu have argued that moral neural enhancement could increase an agent's autonomy by making her more reason responsive and increasing a kind of moral impulse control. They argue that this kind of second order moral neural enhancement would increase rather than diminish an agent's freedom by freeing her from counter moral emotions that constrain rational thinking. What, by the way, I don't. Who the fuck knows what rational thinking is? Is again. Uh, weasel words when you start talking about rationality remind me who knows exactly what rationality is ain't none of you ain't none of us not me either but I mean it's like that's what they like to say this is the rational thinking that's not you gotta be careful about stuff like that this line of thought concerns what Hyman terms the intellectual dimension of agency, the ability to give and respond to reasons and to act on the basis of this knowledge. Bublitz and Merkel also argue that the intellectual dimensions should be privileged over other dimensions of agency. Again, who are we talking to? We're talking to intellectuals, and they say intellectual dimensions should be privileged over other dimensions. You gotta worry about uh, people who are, you know, stumping for themselves. They say, direct neuro neuronal interventions have the advantage of not relying on willpower. At times, they may even enable rationality by helping a person overcome weakness of will. Again, where is Aristotle when you need him? This is acrasia. This is a term from Aristotle. Is this actually a real thing? Maybe, maybe not. But like, again, what are these concepts and like, how do they relate to each other? You've got a lot of philosophy here that um, they're just trying to treat with drugs and as i think uh a lot of people know or suspect you can't always believe the philosophers either so it's like careful there like and i think willpower is one of these uh things that over time people have uh don't think willpower is actually as real as uh we've been led to believe yeah 
But see, like, thank you, Valpo. But like, it, I think this stuff is funny. But like, this is an ancient concept, and it's like the idea of weakness of will is ancient. It's thousands of years old. Um, no one's ever found the will. It's not like that's a physical thing you can go point to. And so it's like, what exactly is this? But yeah. So, when proponents of moral neural enhancement focus on autonomy as the autonomy of the rational agent to overcome certain emotional responses, they overlook that no dimension of practical agency can be isolated completely from the others. Willpower is real. It slapped Chris Rock at the Oscars. And boy, did Chris Rock take it well. Like, Chris Rock can take a, a willpower slap. <laughs> Arguing that MN promotes agency by enhancing one dimension of agency at the expense of others overlooks the fact that agency relies on functional integration. If the balance among the different dimensions of agency is altered by moral neuro enhancement, agency as such is influenced. Because of functional integration in agency, changing one aspect might influence the other dimensions as well. Okay, so this is, inter this is their final argument here, I guess. This thing right here. They're basically saying, look, since everything's integrated, changing one is changing the others. You're not actually privileging like the rational over the emotional because these things work in concert. And so you can't actually say that there's like two different levels that it's that they all work together in some sense to make uh, agency work. And therefore, if you are privileging one, there's going to be a, un, unexpected consequences to agency and rationality. There is no clear way to break this stuff down. Yeah, since there is no neat separation between the different functions, we cannot pick one aspect as more autonomous than the others. One might object that even on a functionally integrated picture, improving one dimension of agency could still have the effect of promoting agency on the whole. If we think Hyman's University, improve, think of Hyman's University, improving the administration of one department might improve the way the whole university works, but this change might also diminish or completely inhibit the functioning of the university. Of the university, for example, if the improved department receives a disproportionate amount of resources compared to the other departments. In a functionally integrated picture, we need to consider the implications of altering one dimension for all the others. We cannot simply say that an enhancement of one dimension equals an enhancement of agency as such. Until we know more about how agency changes in one dimension influence the functionally integrated whole, we cannot say that an improvement in one dimension equals an improvement of agency as such. So, okay, so basically they're just arguing for holism here. They're saying, look, you can't just pick and choose uh, one thing to you know enhance and say that you are therefore enhanced because you know if I like give you like a giant right arm maybe that's gonna lopside you and cause you back problems like um that could happen uh, <laughs> I just remember a, fr a friend of mine a female friend of mine was very well endowed and she was gonna get a reduction surgery because she was like I'm already getting back problems now and she was like you know it's like yeah she got a lot of attention for her chest but like it was not worth it in some sense um to have that uh, to have the back problems uh so she she i don't know if she ever did it um but like it's like this is the sort of thing do you think like just because you're getting one you can increase one thing and that will that make your life better not necessarily so you have to look at the whole thing and that's the whole argument here is basically you have to look at the whole thing and when you don't actually have all the know all the pieces working together um then you can't assume that improving in one area is actually improving the whole uh bolt-ons and B i don't know what bbls um stand for uh, <laughs> or non -re or the reductive versions thereof you know i don't know enough of uh the uh acronyms that you're using valpo um i'm going to assume that everything you're saying is 100 percent correct Yeah, but like that's the thing, Brazilian butt lift. Oh, um, yes, I mean, bolt-ons and Brazilian. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it's not. Um, yeah, we're on the internet. We're on Twitch right now, just because we know some things. Like uh, we, I'm sure we know a lot of stuff. Oh, Vipers, if you're still here, so I was lurking. 
Um, what's her name? Uh, the person we raided from Aris's last night. And she got, someone dropped, I think, 500 subs on her. Or maybe 200 subs. Like, la like two hours ago. And I was just like, speaking of like stuff, like, so I'm looking at like some goth uh, e-girl that we raided last night. She seems perfectly nice. But like, someone dropped hundreds of subs on her like two hours ago. And, you know, she's freaking out because that's like hundreds of dollars that she was not expecting to get. But it's just like, things you don't expect to like be watching sometimes you're watching on twitch there's nothing like illicit about watching twitch especially that stream it's like she's in normal clothes well no she was in uh uh what's it called she was in um nun a uh, nun attire like sexy nun attire or something um it was called uh something in normie Land, Alice in Normyland. It's something called Alice in Normyland. It was a Viper's Gratitude uh, suggestion. Um, so, <coughs> yeah. <sighs> so, yeah, that was uh, Alice in Normyland is, you know, seems like a decent streamer. and But uh, she's uh, doing well for herself and did very well today. But it's like things I wasn't expecting to be watching. But, like, yeah. E girl in a uh, con uh, what's it called a nun you know convent thing, getting hundreds of subs and people losing their minds and like you know whatever is happening. Yep. Yeah. All right. There's like I should time you out for that one, Valpo. But yeah, so it's like you can be embarrassed about it, but like eh, there's there's nothing to <laughs> the amount of like media we consume nowadays is uh huge <laughs> and so some of it's going to be more uh questionable than other stuff <laughs> uh, yeah this is just what i was thinking about like doing this whole thing still the possibility of moral neuro enhancement compels us to reconsider the interplay of reason and emotions in a naturalistic understanding of practical decision making if we are to overcome rationalistic bias in evaluating action, we need a conception of agency that takes the integration of rationality and emotion into account. Yeah, I mean, w ain't none of us can complain about any of this. We're on Twitch. I'm sure we've all seen streams that, uh, you know, push the bounds. Um, Amaranth is, of course, a thing. Um, like, if anyone doesn't know Amaranth, go check out her content. It's, in some sense, fascinating. It may get you in trouble if, like, someone is standing over your shoulder when you're watching that. But, like, is she doing anything uh, that, like, breaks TOS? Maybe, but it's really close. Probably not. So. But it's like, yeah. So. Hyman emphasizes the different dimensions of agency... What did, what did I say? <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't like I have to say the guy's name as Hyman emphasizes the different dimensions of agency are functionally integrated, but he offers little detail on how the different dimensions are balanced. In particular, the details of how emotions interact with other dimensions are underdeveloped in his account. To understand the interplay between emotions and other dimensions of agency, we therefore need to turn the other to other theories of agency. Oh, come on. That's not even, uh, like, that racy of all the things I could have said. Checking out Amaranth and, uh, like, her stream. It, like, the content there. Yes. <laughs> well, how else are you supposed to describe what she does on stream? In the following, I discuss the ways Joseph Raz, Karen Jones, and Mary Carmen understand the integration of reason and emotion in practical agency. These scholars share the view that we need to understand emotions as integrated in practical agency, but unlike Hyman, they assign a privileged guiding role to reason. Considering their views might help us fill in the details missing in Hyman's account of functional integrated agency. <sighs> gives a whole new meaning to... Yes, she does. Yeah, you know, there's a few. There was definitely vipers. There was one paper where it was literally. I think that's why they wrote the paper together. There was something like that. Joseph Raz died. Oh, that's too bad. I didn't know that. 
what was that paper? I swear it was like it was something like balls and shaft uh, vipers. I for, it was literally like balls and shaft uh, wrote a paper together. I was like, okay, you did that on purpose. Joseph Raz focuses on reason responsiveness to define agency. He argues that we are active to the extent that we believe we are properly responsive to reason, but that reason merely sets the limits of rational limits, which are themselves sensitive to our biological and social structure, and thus determines when we are active. A few months ago? Oh, wow. Yeah, I missed that. Raz specifies that we are... Our we are ourselves when we believe we are responsive to reason and that as a consequence motions and intentions that override our general responsiveness to reason are cases of passivity rather than activity although raz also considers other dimensions of agency ultimately reason responsiveness determines whether an agent is active or passive the implication is that an agent who is acting primarily on emotional considerations should be considered could be regarded as passive Take, for example, conflicted liberal agent Lucy, who, against her own rational convictions and emotional cares, experiences fear when meeting someone from another racial group and as a result moves away from them. On Raz's account, Lucy is a passive rather than active, rather than active since her behavior is not reason responsive. She might become active if she works to overcome her irrational fear or takes a drug that would help her suppress it. But the idea that Lucy is passive when keeping her distance from people of other racial groups does not seem right. It would imply that her racial bias counts as an exculpating factor. Instead, we should try to understand how her action is grounded on emotional considerations. Yeah, so, well, that's like saying everything goes back to like your emotive thing. Um, it's like everything's just emotional in the end, which is fine. But it seems like if you're going to blame everything you do on like an emotion, like if you do, if you're racist and then you're going to track that all back to fear, because like, you know, clearly like if you have to get some sort of uh, emotion out of it, maybe it's anger or hate and maybe it's fear. But like in that case, you're going to you can exculpate anything. Uh, if you're going to try to do that, I'm not entirely sure that this is the way you want to do it. Like her racial bias is an exculpating factor. Is fear any different than racial bias? Um, like, what's that mean? Like, how do you actually connect these two things up? And why would you say one's uh, can uh, be forgiven and one can't? OK, rather than seeing emotional responsive responses as passive we might understand emotions as a way to track real and important reason giving considerations as karen jones suggests because agents see themselves as reason responders jones believes that we can develop a normative yet naturalistic account of practical agency as reason responsiveness in this picture emotions can promote or hinder reason responsiveness our conflicted liberal lucy in hin is hindered hindered in acting on her all things considered judgment by her racial bias but she is still acting even though her emotion does not track her reason giving considerations if lucy's racial bias were suppressed by moral neural enhancement she would promote her all things considered judgment but since the exact nature of this judgment is difficult to foresee she might meet a member of another racial group who actually is a threat it seems difficult to treat her non-moral emotions through general intervention is there such a thing as a non-conflicted liberal? I doubt that, uh, Vipers. Um, maybe those hip. Maybe there's some hippies. Are the hippies like non-conflicted? Uh, I mean, they're just like stoned and happy. So yeah, maybe you go back, like throw back to the hippies. Like you go be a hippie and good to go. It's all good, man. Although Jones takes a step toward integrating emotions and agency, she still understands emotions as hindered or bolstering beliefs. Against this view, Mary Carmen... <laughs> Did they know, Vipers? Against this view, Mary Carmen argues that an agent can be guided by emotional considerations seen as reasons without requiring a belief. Oh, so this is what I was saying before. How, mu how much belief do we actually need to have? Like, we can just do stuff. We don't need to also be thinking about it. We should under so Mary Carmen says we should understand emotional considerations as pro tanto reasons for a an action. An emotional response draws the subject's attention to things of putative significance for her, relatives to her cares. 
And so this is the, also the um, Hannibal Lecter uh, in Silence of the Lambs. Don't your eyes go to what you seek? Like, doesn't don't you just you go that way? Don't they? Don't you just seek out what you want? Because like it's saying that your first order stuff, the things that you actually are, you know, physically drawn towards, are actually determining like second order stuff maybe not determining but like they are finding you the second order stuff that you actually do want and so the second order sort of the uh rational stuff might not be so accurate the first order ones your eyes go to what you want that might be more specific and more accurate to how you actually think about things to distinguish between internal and external cares, Carmen requires that the person identifies with the care and the dispositions that constitute her caring. Commenting on our conflicted liberal, Carmen writes that part of what is so distressing about her experience is that simply not identifying with the emotion or rejecting the emotional considerations is not enough to change the nature of her experience. She has to work at not performing the action she prima facie favors but rejects. Yep. You're like, why am I being racist right now? That's bad. Could the conflicted liberal be helped by moral neuroenhancement on Carmen's account? Suppose a drug could help suppress the emotional responses that are not in line with the cares she identifies with. Getting rid of her racial bias would help her act in accordance with her primary cares and thereby provide an emotional grounding for her agency. Carmen's view of emotional cares as guiding offers a way of describing the emotional dimension of agency to make Lucy's emotions more coherent. Still, Carmen's understanding of emotions as pro tanto reasons give emotions a role in decision making and getting rid of an unwanted emotion would remove a pro tanto reason with the implication that all the all things considered judgment would reach a different outcome. Carmen emphasizes that targeting emotional episodes through moral neuroenhancement would be ineffective since these depend on emotional dispositions and cognitive content. Both emotional episodes and emotional dispositions are part of a complex network of cares, goals, and other cognitive content with the implication that targeting only the emotion is not likely to change the underlying psychology to the extent that robust and meaningful moral change occurs. Again, this is going back to... a. Uh, the holism they're saying look all this stuff is wrapped up together and so if you want to sort of boost one thing you don't know actually what you're doing at that point because these are in some sense these are theoretical things we're not actually there's no like you know uh what's it called like phrenology of the mind where you can just like boost one and it's just a separate piece from the others it's not you can't just upgrade pieces of your mind and assume the other parts are going to work well I keep reading uh, hippies as nipples uh, at the moment, and it's annoying me. Carmen's conclusion is that moral neuroenhancement targeting emotional episodes may be permitted, by, but ultimately ineffective. I agree with Carmen that targeting emotional episodes would be ineffective on a functionally integrated picture of agency. But even if it were possible to alter emotional attitudes more generally, I believe that this would be morally undesirable because it would hinder moral growth and enhance emotional attitudes would not permit future changes in, in agent cares okay so this is new right here they've not talked about moral growth before and i don't know why they're bringing it up right now um so this is interesting because i this is what i was thinking exactly juggling biohazards welcome in hope you're doing well yeah so this is what i was saying you can't see the downstream effects but moral growth is an interesting uh yes vipers that's right it should be how it is. It should be a wafer shaped. If someone does it, I might as well read your thing. If someone does invent an anti racist drug, I hope they administer it in a cracker. There we go. You deserve to have that one read. If we return to Hyman's image of the university, voluntary moral neuroenhancement to increase either reason responsiveness or care coherent control would be like an external auditor whom the university invites to oversee processes and make sure they are in accordance with the overall plans of the university. According to Razing Jones, the auditor would give preference to the university's board of directors by silencing irrelevant inputs from faculty and students. On Carmen's account, the auditor would silence only those inputs that are incoherent with the university's overall mission, as established by the board, faculty, and student together. 
What I see as problematic about the auditor's intervention in both cases is that she is silencing input from members of the university. If she promotes reason responsiveness, she is silencing other members of the university to promote the control of one organ. If she promotes care coherence, she is silencing inputs, input that is not in line with a settled set of cares. In both cases, the university's members are left without particular types of input in their decision making. What types of input are silenced depends on a previous agreement, but once these inputs are silenced, there is no longer any way of changing the interventions of the auditor. This is a problem because the authority to assess and monitor certain inputs is handed over to an external decision maker. On Carmen and Jones's account, monitoring and cultivating emotions is part of an ongoing process that is led by reason. The intellectual evaluations of emotions allow an agent to favor certain emotions, repress others, and consciously cultivate new ones. On these views, the agent is free to change her position any time. She might want to cultivate more em empathy with her friends up to a certain point. If her friends begin taking advantage of her empathic attitude and expect her to be their free psychologist or lend them money and never pay back, she might feel that she has reached a limit of empathy and start to focus on self-care instead. If she has undergone moral neural enhancement to enhance empathic emotions, it is not clear this sort of priority change is possible. Once the guiding role has been assigned through an external intervention, it is not clear how we might change this role if we change our minds. Yeah, yeah, we are doing uh, our sort of uh, heartsy stuff. <coughs> so, but this is the thing. Once you, uh, where's the growth? Where's the change? Once you throw in with some sort of moral neur neuro enhancement, you have basically signed away authority to some external thing as the author is correctly pointing out here but you can't predict all the downstream effects and so what if you ever want to change in a different direction in the future you're not going to be able to do that you're kind of locking yourself into one path and there's no guarantee that that path is the end all be all of human moral uh morality okay Returning to the Tobin case, Shell had voluntarily and autonomously taken the antidepressant Paxil, but he was nevertheless not held responsible for his subsequent acts under the influence of the drug. The balance between the rational dimension of agency through which Shell sought to overcome his depression and other dimensions of his agency had been compromised. The exchange in this delicate balance led the jury to rule that Shell could not be held responsible for his actions. Would this reasoning also apply to moral neuroenhancement? Take the case of author, a medical student with artistic ambitions, which he identifies as irrational and inconsistent with his life plan to become a doctor and help others. In order to focus on his studies, <clears throat> he takes a drug to suppress all artistic impulses. How does this intervention change his agency? Can he still be said to be acting freely after the intervention? The intervention makes the most direct change in the psychological dimension of agency. If we follow Mary Carmen in understanding emotional considerations as pro tanto reasons, then Arthur, ha Arthur has eliminated the possibility of reconsidering his artistic ambition as reasons for changing careers in the future. He has, in effect, bound his future decisions to current deliberations. To do this, he is enhancing the intellectual dimension of his agency to override the physical and psychological dimensions. The result of moral, moral neuroenhancement is voluntary self-stultification, which ties future agency to the all-things-considered decision at one point in time. I believe that this type of emotional self-stultification would not be morally desirable because it ties future decisions to current priorities and cares. Vipers now says, I think the whole paper is abstract bullshit because it presupposes a pure state of unaltered will rather than a fluid fluctuating state of being. Um, why does it make it bullshit in this case? I mean, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying, look, the person's claim here is saying that, look, you can't actually predict downstream uh, consequences. And so the idea that you're going to fix your downstream consequences like very hard by using some sort of technology is problematic. Now you're saying, look, um, there's going to be always fluid fluctuations, but that's kind of what they're saying is that moral neural enhancement is going to break the fluctuating state of being. So I'm not entirely sure that, um, I mean, I'm inclined to actually somewhat agree that there's a problem with deciding that you're making a forever decision right now is what they're saying. Um, 
and I don't know what an unaltered state of will is. Like, I don't care. But like, it's just saying, do you want to make a un, like? Do you want to make an? How do you make a decision that will forever change your rationality going forward? Viper says, because all consequences are downstream consequences of some sort of neural enhancement, including the paper, my criticism, and your defense of it. Yeah. Um, this is the question, though. It's like, well, would you get yourself a lobotomy in that case? Because that's kind of what's going on here, is that there's a difference between me drinking beer and knowing that, like, the effects of this are, I know what the effects are. They're pretty minimal in the long run, unless I drink too much. If I get a lobotomy, it's much more significant. And so I might not be able to really uh, predict all of that stuff. And I think that the difference in scale here matters. But yeah, of course, all decisions matter and they all have like ramifications, sort of like a little butterfly effect. The question here is like we're basically cutting off one of the wings of the butterfly and saying, hey, look, the butterfly is flying better this way. <laughs> Lobotomy would be a good name for craft beer. I would be unsurprised. I would be surprised if there wasn't one. Juggling Biohazard says, imagine if someone is genetically immune to neuro enhancement. Would it be justified in this world of inoculate people to exile this person? Um, yeah, so like, you know, whatever it is, they can't take the moral or enhancement that everyone else sort of gets. Would they be like exiled or a freak or something? Be like, we just don't know what's wrong with them. Like they could do anything at any time. We don't know. Um, yeah, see, and I think that's, uh, the, another good point that the author brought up and this is what, uh, Valpo also, uh, noted with, uh, the... Uh, when Valpo just chimed in a second ago. it's The question is, are we losing something fundamental about what it is to be a person at that point? Um, which was like up here, the, this stuff. Like, um, like, how do you change your priorities? What is, um, what, did it, what is it to have human will? What is it to be a person at that point? Why would you want to do this to yourself? Yes, Val. Uh, moral anti-vaxxers. Uh-huh. I mean, that's kind of what we're getting at it here. It's like, if you're going to have uh, people say, but see, the difference is on the moral level, does that change something about what it is fundamentally to be human? Like, are we actually, you know, making people not human anymore at a certain point and like losing something fundamental about what it is to be human if we are, you know, changing our agency on a grand scale? And so, will we lose something fundamental about being people? Maybe that's a good thing because people are stupid and idiot, idi idiots. But like, you know, I think this is what's it called? The uh, fluoride argument. This is the anti-vaxxer, anti-fluoride people. They're saying that because fluoride's in the water, which makes our teeth, you know, not rot because of the amount of garbage in our food. Um, they're saying that's a large scale mind control that makes us, you know, not fight against the man. And uh, I think that's the conspiracy. And so, yeah, this is um, in some sense, that's exactly what this is. And they like they there's these people who go places where there are not there's non fluoridated water. And so they just have to brush your teeth an awful lot compared to like the people who do live in the United States where there's fluoride in the water to keep our teeth from rotting. And so uh, they do exile themselves because they think the rest of us are, you know, mentally changed by the fluoride in the water and basically we're the sheep because of it. So, uh, and you, you see this sort of thing also um, in some cyberpunk literature. Uh, I know there's episodes of Ghost in the Shell, a standalone complex where you've got reactionaries, people who... Um, are rejecting you know cybernetic enhancements and so this sort of thing it's like they they want to like return to whatever it is to be like a pure human and so like there's definitely going to be more of this sort of moral um reactionary sort of status juggling says the movie Equi equilibrium does this but instead of just a vaccine to stabilize radical behavior they also remove all emotion invoking art yep Viper said, maybe I should write a critical response to this paper that says, begins, I may just be hangry, but... <laughs> um, the problem is... I don't think that the author here would actually disagree. 
like the author here is actually <clears throat> they're kind of on your side vipers they're they're saying look this is the sort of thing that happens and we can't just uh, assume that we can go at this and like fix um things so easily yes eating food changes your mind and then you're not hangry anymore but it's like the author knows this like I, i'm thinking you're playing into uh, sophie Muller's uh thesis here it's like you got to be more careful with uh doing stuff that makes a permanent change that you know being hangry is fixable you just go eat some food and let me finish up this conclusion real quick once we separate the different dimensions of agency, it becomes clear that the moral neuroenhancement debate often conflates the different dimensions when assessing autonomous agents. Proponents of MN argue that reason giving and previous autonomous acts are necessary and sufficient features of agency as such, when in fact they belong to the intellectual dimensions of agency, which is integrated with other dimensions. Instead of focusing exclusively on autonomy, we should focus on accounts that integrate emotional considerations in agency. These show that even when voluntary, even that even voluntary moral neural enhancement interventions would leave the agent without certain pro tanto reasons and thereby alter agency as such by intervening in the balance among the functionally integrated dimensions. These considerations have practical implications for modern jurisprudence to give an answer to whether moral neural enhancement should be permitted. We need to rethink the challenges it poses to agency in terms of functional integration in, in practical agency. The examples from legal practice show that autonomy cannot be our sole focus when evaluating the moral implications of moral neural enhancement. Autonomy is not a legal notion. When deciding whether a person is legally responsible for action, judges do not consider whether they were performed autonomously. Instead, what judges consider is whether there were any exculpating factors that make the agents less responsible for their acts. Viper's Gratitude says, Being hangry is the natural state which we augment with food. Or maybe it's being dead. I don't know where I'm going with this. No way I do. The grave. Yeah, I mean... I mean, we're always like, uh... What's it called? Water... We're all just like dehydrated and water just like keeps us... Uh... We're all just addicted to water. And eventually we die. We, we run out of drinking water. So it's like... Okay. So is there anything to say about this? Um... Yeah. So there's a Kantian philosopher. So I don't know if you guys can see this. Like uh, this person, Sophie, does Kantian philosophy and legal philosophy. I don't hate this paper. This paper's okay. The The issue is you can sort of get the flavor in just a few words, though. Basically, they are saying, look, agency's complicated. We don't know how it works. And boosting one area is not necessarily going to do you any good. And that's really what the problem is. So it's like the idea that we can boost or like change our moral status with a neuro enhancement. There's no guarantee that that's actually going to do what we think it will for agency. And then once you do that, um, you lose. It's hard to, again, tease out all the things. Now, I find this very funny because they don't really argue that for the holism here. They just sort of say this is their preferred thing. Definitely more debatable than the the animal worship we read the other night. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, I think it was a little bit that one was a little silly. This one, it's like, look, this is basically, this is a get off my lawn paper. Actually, is what I'm gonna say. This one's like get off my lawn. You don't really understand agency, and so if you think you're gonna fix it and with uh, making us better, like you're wrong. You don't really understand it. We don't get it yet. We have to do more. So that's the thing. Now the question is, what exactly is a moral neuro enhancement? I don't know. But like, can you actually, as like in this last example, like take out your ability to do art? I don't know if that makes any sense. So, like, I find this all very, um, you know, like, abstract in that no one's, you're not, you can't, like, cut out your ability to do art because you want to be a doctor. Now, can you take certain drugs that, like, will focus you so you can study? Because I know a lot of people do that. I forget what the drug is. But, like, basically, if you don't have 
if you have ADHD, like this will calm you down. But if you don't have ADHD, it will help you like focus on your studies very, very well. And basically, people, what I've read about this was you can um, nootropics, you think? Okay. Um, basically, what happens is you get to like study for hours and hours and hours on end, and you can basically regurgitate everything you, re you read over time. But what happens is you kind of get tunnel vision you can't really do anything else so it basically does give you sort of like artistic blinders at that point and so the question is do you want to do that to yourself that's like well if you want to pass your course i know pe some people do this on purpose so that they can get through college without you know losing their mind yeah I, it might be adderall juggling i don't know like I, i've never taken any of this stuff but l i've heard that this is what um this happens quite often and so the question is, is like, is this even a bad thing? Can you like, you know, forego artistic ability to get through your very hard college classes and then, you know, learn all the things you need to learn in a short amount of time and then be done with it? One of your friends literally gets specific doses of meth or something similar prescribed. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is a common thing and this is what people do. And the question, is there moral implications for this? Yes. The question here in this person that this author is asking is like, can you do this in a more permanent way? And is that a good idea? Maybe not. But like you have to worry about that. Like if you can even do it in a short term thing, maybe you do want to be that way and that's fine. But like then again, that's kind of what we were saying is like uh, Vipers were saying you can take incremental steps. Like if you were hungry, you change your mind by eating some food and you can try and see what test it out. But then like the whole going full hog on this sort of thing seems like it's something different. Viper said the term nootropics first referred to chemicals that met very specific criteria, but now it's used to refer to any natural or synthetic substance that may have a positive impact on mental skills. In general, nootropics fall into three general categories, dietary supplements, synthetic compounds, and prescription drugs. Yeah, I, I, the one I was thinking, I've heard the term nootropics associated with this. Th this is the thing. I can't remember the, the name. I think it was Adderall is what uh the one I had heard like I the article I'd read about this was like a pop uh, popular article about it you know like a magazine or something and but as Valpo said like you can get like specific prescriptions that will do things for you that you know that might work for you so you can get your stuff done and like I mean I'm not questioning the ethics of doing that I'm just saying if you can do that over a short amount of time maybe that's how you want to be um what's it the Erdos number. Um, there's a mathematician, Erdos, a very, 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 very famous mathematician, extremely uh, well published because one of the things Erdos did was Erdos published with so many people. He would go different places, talk to so many different people and, um, you know, publish papers with them. It become, It's such a thing that you can actually get an Erdos number with how many... Uh, um, if you're published and you have co-authors, you can find out how many links of uh, publications you're away from Erdos because he published with so many people that you can get like a uh, number that says how many different, like how many uh, uh, six degrees of separation you are from a published paper that he was a uh, co-author with. I bring this up because Erdos took speed like constantly. And I mean like constantly. And so someone once challenged him to you know, not be taking speed. And he stopped for a month and he said he got no work done, but he said he could, but it was pointless because that meant no math was happening if you couldn't be taking speed. So, like, this is one of the most famous mathematicians of, like, the 20th century was just constantly on speed and that's how all this math got done. And it's, like, a super famous uh, guy. Viper says, is there a difference between augmenting the mind and augmenting the body? Is a coffee like a car? Um, I don't make, you know, like, here's the thing. Holding a pen, in some sense, is like augmenting the body. I can now write with my hand. If I augment my mind... Can I do, is there something similar? I don't think there's a, a whole lot of difference between augmenting the mind and augmenting the body. Things are just more difficult in some sense and sometimes more permanent because we can't just like, you know, pick things up with our mind as much as we'd like to be able to. So um, you can't just like put things in your head so easily. But again, like I said, I can drink beer and then it's, you know, 
like you said, like a coffee, like you get caffeine, like a car. Um, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think there's much of a difference. So, no. But, I mean, yeah, are they different? Yes. But, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you do, Valpo. Uh, you, yeah. Juggling Biohazard says, read an article about Adderall with a college woman in a Harvard who got incredible, incredible grades in her in the short term, but in the long term, her GPA dropped and she couldn't function normally because the brain was so fried. I don't know if that's a dose issue or a drug itself, but still interesting. Yeah, I read something. It wasn't that article, but that was like something about kind of what I read. You can't just withdraw from amphetamines in a month, though. To be fair, he was definitely just suffering withdrawal symptoms in that month. Yeah, he was prescribed late in life and was very productive before that. Oh, oh, hey, Nintendo Pharmacon. I thought he was on, on it his whole life, um, like for a very long time. Um, yeah, I, I, apologize if, uh, I, I apologize if I got the story wrong. But, I mean, uh, it's a famous story. So, like, you can look this up. Yeah, every, everything's a dosage issue. If you drink enough water, you die. That's what I was saying earlier about, like, being addicted to water. But, yeah. But that, that's the thing. Like, did Erdosh was that neuro enhancement for him? I don't know if it was neuro enhancement because the guy was clearly a genius on his own. But like, did it get him productive? Yeah, he. Oh, it was a prescription for depression when his mom died. I did not know that. I thought like for whatever reason I got the story wrong. Then I'm sorry. Interesting. So yeah, he got the, he was on that and it was, and he and it was very productive. Okay. Yeah. Because there's a quote that from him that said, look, I'm not getting off of it because I do more when I'm on it. Interesting. I didn't know that. But okay. But yeah, so the point still stands about the Adderall and stuff, though. I just thought this was a different, uh, another example of it. And hi, Nintendo. I hope you're doing well. So, I don't know. The question is like, what exact, this, but this is what I mean. Uh, JFK took speed too. Um, good for JFK. I've said before, my advisor's uh, wife slept with JFK back when she was in grad school. They were at a conference in some hotel, and they, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, this is the sort of, uh, taking a step back, this is like, th this is a sort of a Kantian reasoning I can get on board with. It's a little bit of a cautionary tale. Yes, it's get off my lawn, but, um, like, I'm not, like, hating it because when you're talking about philosophy and you've got, like, these sort of, like, big ideas and you're fucking with your brain, it's like, you have to be careful. It's like you do. Erdos and his mom were super close because his siblings died young, so she was super protective of him. Okay. Yeah, but he was, like, an old guy at this point. Was he still mama's boy? Like, that's interesting in itself. <coughs> yeah, I, I always wondered if I started, like, writing with other people, would I get an Erdos number? Because you can still get them. There's still, like, because he published with so many people, you can still, like, write with people that were around with people he wrote with, and, like, it's just gonna go on forever. Now, getting a low Erdos number is getting harder and harder. But, uh, yeah. Alright, I don't know. Did anyone else have anything to say about this? I mean, we're definitely over-medicated with, like, caffeine and stuff, but, uh, in, like, the U.S. and for all I know, the Western world, we definitely like to try to modify our brains to do stuff all the time. I'm drinking beer right now. Who am I to criticize? I'm just saying it's overall in a Western culture. Like, it definitely... I know the English... Uh, I mean, being drunk is like a moral thing sometimes. Like, yeah, I can do this while being drunk. Um, so... There's questions like exactly how different is this from what we're doing right now? Um, I don't know. Uh, is like so? Is there really a change? And I guess it's going to Viper's uh, question. Like, how different is anything we're doing? Like in this sort of like more moral neuro enhancement literature, so different from like just everyday caffeine. Um, 
because that's definitely changing how we interact with the world and what we're thinking about and how our emotional responses uh, are, are. We have different emotional responses when we're hyped up on caffeine. It's just like, that's true. So, but anyway, I don't know if I have anything else to say. So let's go see if we can find something else after this. But uh, I thought it was fun. Not a bad paper. So. Oh, yeah. Hello, for this. Oh, we should, you know. Should have gone back to this example. I like this example because they were saying, you know, we've got different. Um, different psychological stuff, different like sort of aspects of how we understand things. And that's true. It's not all just one way of looking at stuff. Yeah. That, I thought that one was all right. 